Good morning, friends. It's great to have you here with us again today on this great occasion. And uh, as Dennis said, this is one of the favorite times of, of the season for many of us. It is a blessing to be in the community of saints to celebrate together, isn't it, on these great days. But before we do, we want to, as always, um, take our time in the word to the Lord. We want to make sure that our hearts are, are sufficiently prepared to hear from the Holy Spirit. And then, of course, um, we're, we want to uh, lift certain requests up to the Lord in prayer also. This morning, our particular focus is going to be our friend Deb Woodcock. So let's, let's, clo let's uh, close our eyes and um, beseech the Lord together. Father, before we come to your word this morning to hear from you, we want to first thank you so much for uh, the gift that you've given us in Deb Woodcock to be with us at Sun Valley Church for the past 19 years. As we all know, she has been a source of great encouragement and blessing to us all. We thank you for giving her and her husband Kim to us 19 years ago and the, the faithfulness that we've experienced and been blessed by uh, during those 19 years. Father, we want to specifically lift her up and ask you to encourage her to bring assurance of your love and care to her heart as she now faces more challenges in her life. And if it be your will, we would ask that you would restore her to good health. Uh, we need her here. We love both her and Kim. And, and I pray that you will give the Woodcock family during this, this Advent season a blessed, blessed time together, that you will fill their hearts with joy and that um, you will be central to their thinking and to their celebrations. But we do acknowledge, Father, your will in all these things. We, we thank you for the providence that you've um, brought to us by the blessing of the Woodcock family. Um, we pray that um, you would continue to use them to bless us here. Father, now as we come to your word, we, we want to be certain to ask your Holy Spirit to illumine your word to our, our hearts that tend to be dull and ask that you would do a miraculous work of of spiritual intervention, that we might hear directly from you, Holy Spirit, and, and our hearts might be divinely touched, so that when we leave today, we'll be different than when we came. And so we pray these things in your name, amen. Uh, for the past month, um, many of you have, have uh, been writing notes to Deb and Kim, and uh, we've been gathering them, and uh, our friend and elder Dennis Smith is going to deliver those now to Deb and we would just want to thank her for so many years of faithful service and uh, all that she means to us and uh, just as a token of our love for you um, uh, Deb and Kim we thank you Deb was really looking forward to this. <laughs> she actually wanted to come up on stage, and I said, no, that's too much. <laughs> we can talk later, Deb. So we're here to worship, right? We're here to worship the Lord. Is that why you came today? I'm assuming it is. I'm assuming that's the reason we come every week is to bring our praise and worship to our, our God, our King, our Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ. But from time to time, we need to, to check the thermometer, don't we? Our spiritual worship thermometer to see how we are doing. To see whether or not our worship is as authentic as we wish it were as we hope it to be. So this morning, I want you to consider, to think about, to 
self-examine your worship. How authentic is your worship this morning even? Let's not think about the past mountaintop experiences that you've had. Let's, let's begin right where we are this morning. How has your worship been? Is it authentic? Or has it been full of distractions and maybe even pretense? This is an ongoing struggle for all of us, isn't it? We have to really be in tune to these things. Today's passage speaks directly to this issue. I'm going to read it for you. If you'd like to join me, you can turn to Mark chapter 11, and we're going to be reading from verses 12 through 21. Mark 11, 12 through 21. On the following day, when they came from Bethany, Jesus was hungry, and seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to see if it could find anything on it. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. And he said to it, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. And then they came to Jerusalem, and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. And he was teaching them and saying to them, "It is, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations? But you have made it a den of robbers. And the chief priests and the scribes heard it and were seeking a way to destroy him, for they feared him because of the crowd and it was astonished at his teaching. And when evening came, they went out of the city. And as they passed in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered away to its root. And Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. So we're going to unpack this text this morning together. Um, And I'm calling my first point the parable of curse because the curse of the fig tree, as famous as it is, isn't about the lack of figs in a particular tree in Judea during the first century. It's not about the figs or the fig tree. Um, it's, It's very important that we see exactly what Jesus is doing between the connection of the fig tree and the temple cleansing. Jesus used the fruitless fig tree to communicate something extremely important to Judaism and about Judaism, about the necessity of authenticity in worship. The power of this passage, I think, will come into focus as we move along in our exposition this morning. But the first point, um, the first heading, is the parable of curse. And the first thing that we see under this heading is the humanity of Jesus. Did you notice that Mark mentioned that Jesus was hungry. And, you know, between divine and human beings, humans are the only ones who get hungry. Why does Mark let us know that Jesus was hungry? Of course, he mentions it to introduce the idea of the fig tree. That's why Jesus approached the fig tree, hoping to find figs, because he was hungry. But we see these kinds of comments sprinkled throughout the Gospels about Jesus' humanity to let us know that Jesus, our Savior, was fully human. And why is this important? Well, if you've been here for any length of time, you know that the human nature of Jesus Christ is critical to our salvation, isn't it? Hence, he had to be human which meant he would have been hungry on occasion. Matthew's gospel, for example, highlights the royal line of Christ tracking his human heritage, starting with Abraham through King David and ending with Jesus Christ. Luke tracks Jesus' human lineage, starting with Jesus and moving backwards all the way to Adam. The gospel of John flips the nature of Christ from human to divine by beginning his gospel saying, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And who do we discover the word is? Jesus Christ. And so Jesus in the beginning was God. Jesus 
starting with Mary, was man. And so we have this focus in the Gospels of the divine and human nature of our Savior, Jesus Christ, which is why we read things like this throughout the epistles and here in Hebrews 2.14. Since therefore the children, that is us, the children of men, share in flesh and blood, he himself, who? Jesus himself, likewise partook of the same things, watch, so that through death, he had to be human, so that he could die, he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil. Without his physical human body, there would be no destruction of the enemy. There would be no destruction of sin. We re- we, in fact, we'd remain in our sins for eternity. And so Mark here in our text today is trying to connect the dots for us to show us that Jesus' divinity slash his miracles, which one of the, his miracles in this book is the killing of a fig tree with a word, and his humanity come together perfectly in our Savior. Divine, human, Savior, necessity. <clears throat> Jesus was hungry. If Jesus is going to represent us before God, if he's going to mediate between God and man, divine and human, he must be both. And such he is, which the Gospels make a big deal of. But now let's turn to the condition of the figs that we have here in front of us in this story. Let me tell you some things about fig trees that you may not know. In fact, that I didn't know all that well before I studied for this sermon. Fig trees were everywhere in Israel, very common, kind of like apples, apple trees in Yakima, fig trees in Jerusalem, fig trees in Israel, everywhere. And at the time of the Passover, which would have been spring, it would have had unripe but edible figs. If a fig tree was in leaf, it would have edible figs because figs actually produce fruit before they produce leaves. So when Jesus showed up to pick an edible but not ripe fruit, he found nothing and it disappointed the creator of fig trees. I created this tree to produce figs, it's not doing it. Now now follow figuratively with me on these things, okay? Now let's look at the curse of Jesus. We see here the humanity of Jesus, the condition of figs, and now the curse of Jesus on this poor innocent fig tree, minding its own business, producing at least shade, right? It was in leaf. But despite the promising appearance, it was in leaf, the tree was barren. And on seeing this reality, Jesus cursed the tree, and it died immediately. And some really smart people have struggled to see why Jesus acted this way, towards an innocent fig tree, with all of its feelings. All right? New Testament scholar T.W. Manson, for example, wrote this, it is a tale of miraculous power wasted in the service of ill temper. (laughs) As it stands, he continues, this is simply incredible. William Barclay, noted New Testament commentator, he added this, the story does not seem worthy of Jesus. There seems to be a petulance in it. The atheist philosopher, we can expect this from this guy, Bertrand Russell, accused Jesus of vindictive fury. He was a little kid that got upset that he couldn't get his candy, and so he destroyed the thing that was supposed to produce the candy. (laughs) Surely crabbiness isn't behind Jesus' actions here. This is the only record of Jesus leveling, leveling a curse by way of miracle in all of the Gospels. This is the only time this happens in the gospel, so there ought to be something particularly important that we ought to be paying attention to here, right? If something only happens once and is recorded in scripture, bing, <laughs> all right, pay attention, which is why we're here looking at this text today. So what is Jesus teaching here? You've probably got 
an idea since you've been sitting here during the entire service so far. What is Jesus teaching? Well, he goes on to the demonstration of the curse here, the second main point. He moves towards Jerusalem and into the temple courts. From outside the city where he cursed the fig tree to inside the city, into the temple courts, all to communicate the same thing. So he cursed the fig tree, and then Mark moves directly into the account of cleansing the temple. Because of Jesus' observation of the spiritual health of Israel and the temple practices, Jesus, who happens to be Lord of the temple, took it upon himself to clean house. It was his house, so he can clean it if he wants to. Right? The temple scene was distinctly chaotic. I don't know if you picked that up here, but it's, it was, in fact, distinctly chaotic chaotic. It was Passover week when this took place, and Passover, of course, saw two to three million more Jews come into Jerusalem than before this week, and the temple courtyard was the public meeting place, and everyone who was anyone was there. The court of the Gentiles is the place, uh, the name of the place where all this took place, uh, the, where the cleansing took place, and the court, this particular courtyard was immediately outside the inner temple of the holy places the holy place and the most holy place. Then this court of the Gentiles. And they called it the court of the Gentiles because that's all the further the Gentiles could get. Can't get any closer than this, Gentiles. This is it. That's where we would have stopped if we were been there, if we would have been there. But the court of the Gentiles was a walled, paved with marble, massive courtyard. It was 300 yards by 250 yards in size. The walls were... uh, Around the walls of the perimeter of this courtyard were merchant stalls where they would be selling their goods, including the money changers. They'd be on the perimeter. And, of course, money changers um, had to be present because when foreigners, these foreign Jews, came to Jerusalem with their foreign money, they couldn't use it in temple practice. It was forbidden. And so money changers was there, and they would take your two pesos and give you one dollar. And in the midst of this would make massive amounts of money, which didn't make Jesus happy. They were taking advantage of people. Livestock were being sold and traded. Food was available. The sacrificial lambs were being sold for the Passover sacrifice and meal. And all of this added to the chaotic scene of the temple when Jesus arrived here on this Tuesday to cleanse the temple right after cursing the fig tree. If you've been to the animal barns at the fair, uh, you have a small idea of the smells and sounds that may have been part of the court of the Gentiles during this Passover week, and then times it times a thousand. So you you go to the fair and you smell all sorts of things that you just soon forget, and you hear it's just, it's chaos in those animal barns at the fair. Um, It was kind of like the New York Stock Exchange uh, meeting the State Fair, meeting Barnum and Bailey Circus in this court of the Gentiles. That was was going on. (laughs) And so this scene, this scene, particular scene, offended Jesus because God intended the temple to be a place of worship and prayer, not commerce, not entertainment, worship and prayer. And so the temple was to be a holy place set aside for communion with God and his people. Hence, it was called the tent of meeting. And so Jesus' curse of the fig tree was intended to demonstrate divine judgment on Israel's empty and false worship. It is also an ongoing warning to anyone, including us, Sun Valley, including us, you who are sitting in the pews at Sun Valley, who would pretend to worship God or who would do so flippantly. This is where this particular text hits home. How is your worship? Since God is omniscient, he knows when anyone or any church is truly worshiping or just going through the motions. And of course, as you can tell from this text, he doesn't take false worship kindly. Israel struggled with this particular problem throughout their history. Listen to Isaiah chapter 1. Isaiah begins his prophetic book with this very concern. He says this, God speaking through Isaiah. 
Bring no more vain offerings. Incense is an abomination to me. Incense was part of their worship. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath are calling of convocations. I can't endure iniquity and solemn assembly. God is saying you're making me sick to my stomach in your worship. They have become a burden to me. Your feasts my soul hates. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands, oh, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. When you spread out your hands, I hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your deeds before my eyes. Cease to do evil, learn to do good. Seek justice, correct oppression, bring justice to the fatherless. Plead the widow's cause. In Isaiah's day, and in Jesus' day, and in our day. In Matthew 15, 7 through 9, Jesus said this, You hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy about you when he said, This people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. It's not going well in Israel's, Israel's history of worship. And not to be outdone, our tendency, our natural tendency, is to drift away from the dock, isn't it? Spiritually speaking. To drift away from God, to drift away from authenticity and worship. And this means we must fight for faith, we must fight for authenticity, we must fight for spiritual worship, we must fight against apathy, distraction in our worship, whether it be private or corporate. We need to plead with God as we enter worship in this room on Sunday morning, in your quiet room at home, to remove any pretense that may be there and to remove all distractions that keep us from authentic spiritual worship. This is why we start the service the way we do with a prelude of meditation. Can you remember what the verse was on the overhead during the prelude meditation? Was your heart engaged enough to at least look at that and interact with it? The religious life of Jesus' day was flat out dead. It was fruitless. His curse of the fig tree and its death foretold the curse and death of Israel's spiritual life. And of course we know in A.D. 70, the Roman armies under the command of Titus sacked Jerusalem and destroyed the temple. Forty years after this prophecy. So here under the demonstration of the curse, of curse rather, we see the divinity of Jesus. We saw the humanity of Jesus in the first section. Here we see the divinity of Jesus. And of course, we see the divinity of Jesus right off the bat when he curses this tree and it dies. I mean, how many of you have done that? I mean, we've all cursed trees probably, uh, but none of the ones I've cursed have died, unless I curse it with my chainsaw. <laughs> but here in this passage, we have a transparent view of the nature of Jesus Christ. Human, he was hungry and divine, the tree died because he said, be cursed. Next, we see the condition of the Jewish hearts. In the first section, we saw the condition of the fig tree. Now here we see the condition of the Jewish heart. Look at it. The day before, which was Monday, when Jesus had entered triumphantly into the city, uh, he stopped by the temple at the end of the day after the triumphal entry and had taken notes. He was watching this circus unfold in front of him. And of course, Jesus was grieved by the spiritual condition of the people and how they used the place designed to meet with God as a marketplace instead of a holy place. And one important element of this story, which isn't on the surface, is that fig trees had been the standard symbol of Israel throughout its history. God refers to Israel as a fig tree throughout the Old Testament in numerous places. And here, Jesus conveniently finds a barren fig tree to curse on his way to cleansing the temple. 
And so the fig tree that Jesus approached, knowing it was fruitless, would be a perfect parable of Israel's fruitlessness. Jesus had seen this spiritual fruitlessness in the temple the day before and throughout his entire ministry. And so he could easily connect the dots for us by showing us that Israel was like a barren fig tree. It's easy to see, isn't it? Just from this text, without going into too much history. The, the tree looked somewhat healthy from a distance, which is why Jesus approached. The worship looked somewhat normal from a distance until you got close. And in our case, people may pass by here driving down Mead, and this may look like a house of worship. It may look normal, but the question is, is it? If we get close enough to the worship at Sun Valley Church, what do we see? If you get close enough to your own heart in your private worship, what do you see? Especially if you don't have private worship. Do you realize that there's no fruit? Friends, no mistake that the temple was a magnificent building. Impressive in every regard. I mean, just thinking of a 300 by 250 yard marble square is impressive enough. But the temple itself behind it was magnificent. The ceremonies that took place within the temple were beautiful. And they pointed to great spiritual truths, primarily the work of Christ Jesus himself. <laughs> the one to whom all the temple and all the temple practices were pointing entered the temple on this day and destroyed it, turned over everything, which many wasn't happy. Israel wasn't producing fruit. Instead of authentic worship, they were faking it. Instead of caring for one another, they were taking advantage of one another. God expected Israel, just as he expects us, to bear fruit. And by the way, according to Paul in 1 Corinthians, we happen to be the temple of the Holy Spirit, don't we? And we're supposed to be bearing fruit. Jesus said this in John 15, By this my Father is glorified. This is how you glorify God the Father, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. How do you glorify God? By giving a lot? By serving a lot? By going on a missions trip? By bearing fruit? Friends, please look beyond Israel for a moment with me. Look at the current temple of the Holy Spirit, which is your heart if you're in Christ. 1 Corinthians 3.16, do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's Spirit dwells in you? Do you realize what's going on here? What a lesson for us. God's approval of our church, God's approval of your spiritual life your spiritual life isn't if we look good on the outside, if we're just bearing leaves. Our spiritual health isn't determined by how many programs we have in place at Sun Valley or how many people we have attending our services or how many missionaries we send to the mission field. None of those things are the measure of fruitfulness. No, our spiritual health, the thing that God is interested in and is looking for in his local church is whether or not we are producing spiritual fruit. And you say, what is spiritual fruit? And I'm glad you asked because it's going to be uh, explained here in a moment. But first, let's finish this second point by looking at the curse of Jesus on the false worship at the temple. On this particular Tuesday, the day after the um, triumphal entry, Jesus didn't enter, enter Jerusalem and go to the temple to worship. It's not why he went. He went to declare divine judgment on shallow and false religion and all the activities that were surrounding it. Jesus went to purge the temple courts of corrupt merchants, of corrupt religious leaders, of corrupt worshipers, and then he calls them robbers. Did you notice that? 
You've made this place, the house that God intended to commune with you, a gathering of robbers. The high priest Annas and his son-in-law Caiaphas were the most corrupt of all in this setting. They sold or rented the merchant stalls in the court of the Gentiles. Because they were the high priest, they said what goes. They said what goes is the money into my pocket. That's what they said. And so they rented or, or sold these high rent stalls around the inside of the courtyard to merchants. <clears throat> and then they took a large portion of all the sales that went to those merchants. Jesus also stopped all the people from using the courtyard as a shortcut to the other side of the city. Look at verse 16. And Jesus would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple courtyard. And that would cut off 30 minutes. <laughs> but Jesus says, you're not using this for a shortcut. So you can go on the other side of that wall and sell more goods. And take advantage of more people. And desecrate this place. He stopped them all, closed the gate, and made them go around the outside like they were supposed to. It was against Jewish law to walk through the temple courts <laughs> to sell on the other side. And yet they were doing it all the time, every day. Jesus put a stop to it. And then Jesus quoted from Isaiah 56, 7. He says, my house shall be a house of prayer. And isn't prayer central to worship? Yes, it is. It has been since the beginning. Uh, it's central to our worship here at Sun Valley Church, which is why we sprinkle our service with prayer. We have an invocation, which you heard this morning, which is the inviting or invocation of God's presence with us. Then we have the prayer of confession, which is an acknowledgement of our sin and need for God's forgiveness. Then we have the pastoral prayer where we intercede for one another and for God's blessing on his people. Then during the pastoral prayer, we ask the Holy Spirit to open our hearts and our minds to his word so that we might benefit from it. Then at the end of the service, you will experience a benediction where we ask God to bless us and use us for his glory during the coming week. Prayer is integral to worship, which is why Jesus said, my house shall be called a house of prayer. Do you remember when, well, some of you remember when we first got this building, it had, it looked like a bowling alley in here. Remember that like 10 foot ceilings or eight foot ceilings, whatever it was with those eight foot fluorescent tubes. And right above here on that wall was that verse, Isaiah 56, my house shall be called a house of prayer. You remember that? That's what this is supposed to be. Verse 18, if you'll look at your text, and the chief priests and the scribes heard it and were seeking a way to destroy Jesus, for they feared him because all the crowd was astonished at his teaching. So this acknowledges here, verse 18, that Jesus was extensively teaching during this week. The other gospels record some of his sermons. So the leaders wanted to destroy Jesus because he was a threat to their authority and to their pocketbooks. And maybe in reverse order. On the way back to Bethany, verse 20, they passed that same fig tree and Peter remarked that it had died and withered. <laughs> Look, Jesus, it's dead. This is recorded, of course, to affirm that whatever Jesus says goes. And if you want a wake-up call to the spiritual life of our church or the spiritual life of your own experience, then go to Revelation chapter 2 and 3 and see how we're doing. The tree withered. Israel's worship had withered and would be destroyed, which it was in AD 70. And so this story is directed primarily at the false and shallow worship of the Jews, but... The Holy Spirit, I think, this morning would have us direct our attention to our own spiritual condition. We have plenty of fodder to uh, look down our noses at the Jews, right? But that's never the intended purpose of our scripture teaching and preaching. 
God intends us to look inward. God intends us to use this passage to examine our own worship and our local church's worship. And so let's go to the third point, the avoidance of curse. The parable of curse, the demonstration of curse, now the avoidance of curse. <clears throat> and again, starting with our Savior, we saw his humanity in the parable of curse, we saw his divinity in the demonstration of curse and killing of the fig tree, and now let's look at both the divine and human nature of our Savior, which I said earlier is a requirement of our salvation. There is no salvation except with the shedding of blood, we read in Hebrews. There's no forgiveness of sin. You thought your sins could be forgiven by just weeping and wailing and moaning on some altar? No. The only way sins are forgiven is blood is shed. Hence the need of a human savior. And yet that sacrifice must be divine. It must be perfection. There can be no hint of sin in that sacrifice or it is no value to the sinner who claims such. See, Jesus, as the God-man, came to save people from their sins, not to endure the practice of their sins. See, when Jesus saves people, things change. The goal of our salvation is transformation, not a ticket to heaven without transformation. Don't misunderstand that primary, basic, fundamental element of our salvation. Jesus dying on the cross for your sins is not a ticket for your salvation. It's a command for your transformation. And so we read in 2 Timothy 1.9, God saved us and called us to a holy calling. He didn't save us to, so we can continue in our sin, so we could get to heaven one day. No. He saved us to a holy calling. To be transformed, in other words. And then... We read this morning, Dennis read this morning to us in Romans 6, this wonderful verse, verse 22, but now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to God, that's describing your conversion. Now that you have been set free from sin and become slaves to God, listen, the fruit, the fig of the fig tree, the fruit you get leads to sanctification. The fruit of being saved by God is change. There's no avoiding that in Scripture. No change, no salvation. If God changes you, if Jesus, the God-man, touches your heart, you change every time. Amen. Every time. There's no such thing as an untransform, untransformed, uh, saved person. It doesn't exist. There's no such thing as an untransformed, saved person. If you're not transformed, you're not saved. And so there is that divine human savior aspect that's necessary for our salvation. Next, we see the condition of our hearts. We saw the condition of the fig tree, it was fruitless. We saw the condition of Jewish hearts, fruitless. What's the condition of our hearts? Your heart, this morning. Look inward here. Forget the Jews. Look inward. This text presents us with a wonderful opportunity to examine our worship, which is central to our transformation. Only transformed people want to worship. 
Are, are we claiming to be Christians like the tree claimed to be a fig tree without fruit? Like the Jews claimed to be God's people without the fruit? Are our lives full of leaves but without fruit? Is your life full of leaves? What a wonderful Christian. Oh, they go to church every Sunday. Look at them. Aren't they something? How about the fruit? Let's look at how this might look in our own lives. Are we click quick to declare our creed? This is what we believe here. At, uh, the, the five points of Calvinism. This is what we believe. This is what we believe about inerrancy. This is what we believe. Are we quick to declare our creed and doctrine, but unwilling to exercise simple faith in simply serving in your local church? Oh, but I believe. Well, who cares what you believe? Transformation is what's on, on the table here. Who cares what you believe? We seem willing to argue to the nth degree about many doctrines or what Christians ought to be doing in the political world or in the social arena, but we seem to struggle to be kind to our neighbors. You know the kind of reputation Christians have in local restaurants? <laughs> They're cheapskates. Two of my three kids served uh, at restaurants here in Yakima, and they always were depressed when they were assigned people who had come from church on Sunday morning because they wouldn't tip. <laughs> no tips. They'd smile, talk about the sermon, no tips. Fruitless. We're going to split theological hairs, but we won't pursue our own holiness. Fruitless. Jesus would say the curse is for those who are all talk and no walk. That's what Jesus would say. That's what he said. <laughs> Bearing leaves and no fruit can be also seen in a person who will talk about regrets but never repent of the things they regret. Have you ever listened to a sermon or read an article or a book and felt grieved because of your sin? Have you said you're sorry for sinning, but quick to return to the same sins that you said you're sorry for? Regrets, but never repentance. Leaves without fruit is also seen in having plans, but never acting. Next year, I'm going to read through the Bible in a year. Next summer, I'm going on the mission trip to Papalote. Next time I'm at my friend's house, I'm going to share the gospel. Strike out, strike out, strike out. And in Jesus' scheme of things, you get three strikes and you're out, just like baseball. This story of Jesus cursing the fig tree and then going to the cursed Jewish religion is a story about the importance of bearing fruit in our spiritual lives. How are we doing? Are we bearing fruit? Are you bearing fruit? Am I bearing fruit? Jesus said that fruit bearing is what God desires. I read it for you earlier, John 15. Jesus said that you'll either bear spiritual fruit or you'll expect to be cut down and thrown out in John 15. So let's avoid the curse of Jesus. 1 Thessalonians 4, 7. For God has not called us to impurity, but holiness. Holiness is a spiritual fruit. Are you, are you growing in holiness? Or are you finding more gray areas to maneuver as a shallow Christian? 2 Timothy 2.21, Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. That's the transformation that Jesus desires. That's the transformation that Jesus gets from everybody that he touches. Not just 50%, everybody that he touches. 
So to wrap this up, is your talk more impressive than your walk? Here are some examples of what spiritual fruit ought to look like in our lives. Affection for God. Do you have a genuine affection for God? Are we in love with God? Are we in love with Jesus? And Jesus, of course, said our love for him would, would be revealed in what? Our obedience, right? And so to examine your love for God, to examine your love for Jesus, are you obeying? And not just your favorite areas of obedience, of obedience? Are you obeying? Another spiritual fruit looks like affection for God's people. Affection for God, affection for his people. Jesus said our affection for people would be the mark of his true followers, right? By this, all men will know that you're my disciples if you have love one for another. And then 1 John, of course, chapter 3, describes what love looks like. It's not just talk. Oh, go and be well fed. Lord bless you on this wonderful Advent season. And then affection for God's word. Affection for God, affection for his people, affection for his word. The apostle Peter who said, hey, look, Jesus, the, the tree is withered and died. That Peter said, crave spirit, pure spiritual milk. Crave the word of God. Crave intensely. Do we? How often do we open the book? Once a week? How often do we open the book? Jesus said that his word is truth and his word transforms. If you're a little bit on unsure footing right now because you've seen some fruitless branches in your life, maybe examine this particular point first. The love of the word of God. It transforms us into his image. Maybe the reason we're not more like Jesus is because we're not in his word as we ought to be. Just an idea. And then another fruit, and we could go on, but I'm going to end with this one, affection for the lost. Affection for God, affection for his people, affection for his word, affection for the lost. His creation. Jesus said that a central concern of his people would be to go and tell them the good news of Jesus Christ. Are you? What's the first thing that crosses your mind when you meet a new person? What, could they, what they could do for your business? What can they do for your fancy, fantasies? What could they do for your neighborhood? Your pocketbook? What comes to mind when you meet people? Is it their need for Jesus? And you immediately start strategizing how to get the gospel into their heart and mind? Sun Valley Church, are we bearing fruit? Christian, are you bearing fruit? Look in the mirror of God's word. Let's prepare our hearts now. If this isn't a solemn enough moment, let's add the Lord's Supper to it. The Lord's Supper is a wonderful time for introspection, isn't it? It's a time where we think about Christ and Him crucified for our salvation, where we, where we see represented in the elements pictures of his broken body, his spilt blood for our salvation, for our transformation, for our authenticity. So as we look now into the Lord's Supper, let's examine ourselves and our spiritual fruitfulness. And if you, like most Christians, under the weight of a sermon like this, 
feel inadequate or unworthy, then run forward for the elements. Maybe literally. But don't run over somebody who's trying to get here also, if you want to run. The elders are going to serve you the elements up front, and um, we hope that you'll come under the weight of self-examination, but also uh, under the expectation, the anticipation of great joy. Knowing that, that Jesus, God, the Holy Spirit, meet us in our weakness. He, he meets us in our need. Like the poor man with the demon-possessed son, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. So as I read the words of institution from, from 1 Corinthians 11, the elders who are going to be serving you will come forward, and then I'll pray and thank God for the gift of his Son, our Savior. Listen as I read. <clears throat> Paul said, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Pray with me. Oh, Father, in contemplation of the text we've just heard preached, we feel inadequate, we feel unworthy, we feel... Um, Sorry for our lack of fruit bearing. And yet the solution isn't to run and hide as Adam and Eve did, but to run to you, run to the source of strength and hope. Run to our Savior, Jesus Christ, and to the elements that represent uh, his work on the cross for us, his work for our salvation, his work for our sanctification. And so, Father, I pray that you would keep anyone in this room from running away from you at this moment and from hiding in their pew. But draw them, Holy Spirit, I pray, draw them up front. Having embraced you as Lord and Savior now, believing that you will meet them in the elements and minister to their heart and their soul's deepest needs. Father, bring them forward be blessed and strengthened by the one who died on Calvary's cross for them. We thank you, Jesus, for this clear and undeniable picture of your humanity and divinity, of your clear and undeniable omniscience of our spiritual health, and in your undeniable and clear presentation of your love. Bless us now as we come forward in faith to receive from you. Amen.